very, very important slide to get you started. So if you do anything, when you take this back on a record and have a look at this slide. So can you show empathy? Now by showing empathy, it means you care. It means you've got, you wanna show understanding. You're gonna be curious as to what makes your goalkeepers tick. Don't be afraid to ask questions. As you well know, guys, I worked for the great man, Sir Alex Ferguson for five years. Biggest thing I learned from him, never be afraid to ask the players. So that's the same for yourselves with your goalkeepers. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That all of a sudden then you'll start to see a different dialogue once you start to be a listener and not just a talker. For you, extrovert, you'll all know that. These to me are the very assertive people, social people. They feel very confident, they ooze confidence and confidence. You start to think about if your goalkeeper is an extrovert. What about an agreeable personality? He's very respectful, major, major. Unbelievable trust in others, teammates, staff members. He's compassionate, he or she. Introvert, quiet, reserved. You might find it now. Certainly wouldn't have been me as an introvert when I was a goalkeeper. I would have fitted into the extrovert and possibly one or two other sections. So you would be looking introvert. Who's, have you got somebody who's very quiet, he's reserved, but that doesn't mean he's not reliable and he's the calmest goalkeeper when he needs to be. Self-aware, which I'm sure you're going to find out. This is the really, really big one for me, that when you're dealing with people at the top level, they use their individual strengths. Uh, John Achterberg hit it on it last week about Alisson. He wanted to improve himself, but that was only for the benefit of the team. So you'll see the gentleman that I work with, this was definitely him. He, persona was it was all about him it wasn't it was about him using his ability his individual strengths his strength of mind to help the team so see if you've got somebody who fits that bill and the last one we'll cover conscientious he's an organizer he's very assured he's happy to take responsibility happy to be a number one wants that added responsibility. I have coaches on the call tonight who maybe have a similar situation. They have a number one who's very demanding and the number two is maybe not quite at the level they have to be at. How would our coaches on the call tonight manage that within the training environment? I think you'd have to do where you've got the number two who doesn't feel as secure in terms of his, let's say it's his te technique, it might be an in-possession skill or defending the goal skill. I think what you wouldn't do is you wouldn't put the session on that would make the number one really tower above them in terms of ability level. You would then say, right, let's get involved in the session. So you might have, say, your number one, you might have him in to start. Then you'd have the number two in for a smaller amount. Then you would say to the number two quietly, we're going to come back this afternoon and we're going to work on the areas that you want to improve. We never talk about weakness. We always talk about areas to improve. And then we'd say, right, then we'll start to build this up on the little 1v1 sessions for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Then eventually, as the confidence got more and more, we could start to drip feed them in and spend more time with the number one. Uh, like every position, we have to look at the game. We look at the game and we go to the training. We split the game in specific moments. In my case, I, I, I split in these eight moments, but there are guys that maybe they split in two moments or in four moments or in 10 or in 20 moments. But it's important to do like everybody do uh, to the other positions. We split the moments, uh, the, the game specific moments, and we work that moments. We need to work that moments. Okay, just to explain to you uh, what is the build up for me and the back pass and the distribution, because all the others in the defensive process, I think you, you understand. Uh, the build up for me, it's the, the, it's the goal kicks. Okay, the, 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 it's the building up, starting the build up. It's when the goalkeeper starts the build up. The back pass, it's easy. My partner has the ball and, and I, uh, I receive a back pass and the distribution, it's when I have the ball in my hand. I distribute with my foot, with my foot or with my hand, okay? Building up or uh, in a transition. Another myth about the split step. <laughs> this goalkeeper, it's one of my favorites. One, one of my favorites goal, favorite goalkeepers, one of the best goalkeepers in the world and in, and in the history. And uh, I gave up um, 
trying that my goalkeepers uh, stop doing the split step. What I do now, it's try them, try for them to, 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 to do the split step on the correct timing. Okay. And this superhuman goalkeeper, because it's only possible to, to save balls if you are a superhuman with the split step he does in the timing that he does. As you see, the shot was from here and only he got to the, he got to the floor when the ball was halfway to the goal. So he's superhuman. Uh, as you can see, he's doing it on the, on the wrong timing, in my opinion. Okay. And this is, this is one of the best goalkeepers in the world. Uh, great saves, but you can, you can see mistakes too. Okay, jumps, the ball is already half time and you have less time to perform your action. So, uh, in my opinion, doing a split step, it's not a mistake, but doing it on the, on the, cor on the wrong timing, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Another myth about the goalkeeper side and the wall side. Okay, in, uh, in my opinion, it's like this. Okay. Two guys on the ball, this is a, just an example. Two guys on the ball and uh, he makes the wall like this, okay, on this guy and he stays close to the center of the goal. Not here, not here, because this is my side and this is the wall side. No, no, no. All the goal is goalkeeper's goal. All the goal, okay. He stays here, but ready to save the ball here and ready to go and save the ball here. Okay, this is my, my opinion. Stop calling this just the wall side. To help the goalkeeper. Not staying here, but gaining some time here. Again, gaining some time here. Reaction time, reaction uh, and time to, to displace and perform. Last key point, don't guess I stay like this because I need to save the ball on the wall side, but I need to stay. If the ball goes on the wall side, I go. If the ball goes on my side, I stay and I save the ball, okay? It's, the, all the goal is the goalkeeper's, goalkeeper's uh, ball. Uh, these would be our in-possession principles, scan, find, exploit. And then we would have sub-principles um, with different videos to show the kids before they train. So um, we can't just do one big dump on all of our principles in one session, expect that our players are going to be able to do them all. Um, we need to layer and scaffold the information um, especially with youth players, it's important that we identify or um, layer that information and go a little bit slower than we would with, say, professionals who have seen um, these different environments over and over and over. Um, but we need to allow um, space for them to consolidate information that's being showed. Um, and this is really called um, desirable difficulty. So you wanna make sure that your sessions aren't too hard for your players or too easy because then their brains turn off and they're not gonna learn anything. Um, our second principle is to plan and work in training blocks. This was a graph that um, I actually got out of Doug Lamoff's book and I asked him permission to share it, so it's okay. Um, but this really changed the game for me, um, understanding how we forget things. Essentially everything that you've ever learned, you've already forgotten, um, but you have to retrieve that information. As you are learning, you are in a constant battle against forgetting everything that you've ever learned. So let's say on Monday, we work on um, fake pass. And so on Monday we get fake pass. And by the time Sunday occurs, which is typically like the uh, game rhythm of a week. If I've done it on Monday and Phil knows how to do fake pass on Monday and I've done it and, you know, I've introduced this new topic. He understands fake pass. By the time Sunday rolls around, he's remembered a little bit more than 20% of what he actually learned. Um, even if we had the perfect session with Phil and he learned fake pass in one hour later, he's already forgotten 50% of what he's learned. 
almost that you almost everything that you do in just one session alone will not lead to lasting learning. We have to have a sequence of sessions with intervals of time um, between the concepts where they're retrieved. And that is actually how we're gonna get to mastery. So it's important that we understand that so that we can set up trainings to recall and retrieve new information. And eventually over time, it will lead to more lasting, durable learning. Um, so how does that reflect at our training at the Keeper Institute? So um, these are how we, we plan our training blocks. We actually plan our training box in eight weeks with all the topics in possession and out of possession. And we come up with a list of things that we're gonna revisit that we've done in previous weeks. So um, what actually will help to, to your kids to learn new things is allow the process of forgetting to start and then ask them to retrieve that information. Um, if you don't ask them to retrieve that information, it will be lost. Um, and if you want to durable, long lasting development, you have to plan across longer intervals of time. And each time that you call to retrieve it, it might be a little bit more complex and it might be even more challenging. So for us, we don't just plan one session at a time and we say, okay, Phil did fake pass on Monday. Um, he did it really well. So now we can move on next week to um, reverse pass. Instead, we say, okay, maybe we'll teach reverse pass the next week, but we're gonna ask him to recall that fake pass and be able to execute that in training. Now, if you don't have these, this retrieval list or these intended outcomes, what tends to happen is, again, let's go back to this picture, is that we have this environment where we're perceiving everything and it goes into your working memory and things that we've seen before, we can just retrieve. But if it's something that it's new and we have too many new things happening, our brains just become scrambled eggs. And when we ask our players to, to process too much information at once, they actually get slower. They're not able to process any information and they don't do anything well. And typically we get scrambled eggs. So how do we want to develop goalkeepers in, in our organization? First of all, we want to create a pleasant learning environment. That means we all started playing football because it's fun. So we all love this game and, uh, and it's just fun playing football. And, and losing this to whatever reason shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Uh, doesn't matter which, uh, which, uh, which level you play because you, it, it always needs to remain fun with all pressure and with all money in this business it needs to be a pleasant learning environment. Then we absolutely have to fill the toolbox. That means they all need to know which techniques are available. And even more important, they need to know which technique has to be chosen in what situation. Very important. Then they all have strengths and they all have weaknesses. We have to strengthen the strengths and weaken the weaknesses. This is a this is an easy sentence, but it's it's uh, in depth. It's so true that we that we are responsible to do that every day in our work. Then uh, we constantly need new stimuli and uh, particularly deliberately overburden is is nothing that shouldn't be done that that needs to be done in order to make certain situations or scenarios easier for them when they face them in uh, in game situations then to learn to advance implicitly also very important to do this um, we need and this is a must a winner's mentality through constant competition and training competition is absolutely a must and we need the mentality or the willingness that our goalkeepers want to win every competition they face. It can be shooting competition, can be crossing competition, it can be a, a small sided game, and it can be this uh, this normal number game, eleven against eleven. But uh, we need this winners mentality uh, in in our goalkeepers implemented. 
Uh, we need fast acting coverages technically and tactically well-trained goalkeepers in all our clubs. We need to ensure a uniform and permanent training. And also analysis of all goalkeepers in the club. And we need to plan their further development. And there, that, that is what is the will or aim is that we, if we figure out that there is a certain guy uh, in the academy in Brazil and the next uh, logical step for this guy is to jump over to Europe, so we have to think about this, of if this is realistic, and then what, what steps he can take in Europe or the other way around. If we have somebody in Germany uh, who, who is not playing, who is perhaps number two on the bench, would it make sense to bring him over to New York to play for a certain time period, so one season or longer, in the MLS team in order to develop and to gain uh, match practice? So all questions that need to be answered. Uh, and this is something that, that is like my everyday job to, to analyze all the goalkeepers in the various clubs and also uh, to, to set up plans in, in, uh, in, 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 close, uh, in close partnership with, uh, with the goalkeeping coaches in the clubs and also with the, with the sporting directors in these clubs. And the last one. And this is technical training. So they, it's all moving boards. The first one is a cutback just to get them on the ground. For the second goalkeeper then, it's, it's a short pathing with two touches. And for, for the third one, it's an, like an announced ball on his left side. So it's like technical training. They always know, but it's with a certain element of, uh, of tactical uh, scenarios. Okay, so first topic, what is relevance? How do we recognize it? And is it important? So when I started putting this presentation together a couple of days back, I went and thought, right, well, what the hell is relevance? So I got a bit geeky and went online. And, and this, is, this is what came up. Now, I've, I'll, I'm just going to give you a second to read that because it's a, it isn't half a mouthful um, and quite confusing, really. This was a bit of a Google definition I had. So the concept of one topic being connected to another topic in a way that makes it useful to consider the second topic when considering the first. So you probably want to either write that down, take a photo of it or, um, or chuck it away. But once you start thinking about that, you start thinking, blink your neck, yeah? I do have to think about the next thing and how I make the thing before it important. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that on there. And then the, the next thing is relevance is achieved if the task or if the task increases the likelihood of you accomplishing the goal. So basically, you get success if you are increasing the likelihood of winning or completing any given task or objective. So I thought I'm reading them to I'm reading them to definitions and thinking, bloody hell. This is quite important to me, and this is quite important to, to, to coaching and, and helping, helping players improve. Practice or a session, you're probably, well, not probably, you are in one of these three categories. You're announced, you're unannounced, or you're live. And the definition of them is, if it's announced, the goalkeeper is aware of the structure of the session and the type of service. So that's typically, here is the ball, this is the serve I'm going to do. OK, so that's an announce. You're telling them what happens. Unannounced, the goalkeeper's aware of the session structure or the service type. So you're taking away a piece of information. So you might say to them, here's the ball, but I'm not telling you how I'm going to serve it. OK, or flip it on its, on its head. I'm going to kick it off the floor, but I'm not telling you where I'm going to kick it from. So you're removing a piece of information. And live is the goalkeeper is unaware of the structure of the session and the service type. So they don't know where the ball is going to be or where the players are. And they also don't know what type of serve it's going to be. High, low, kick, throw, head. They don't know. What that gives you, if you do announce sessions, it gives you lots of repetitions. 
not so much decision making, lacks realism, but it does have its place. There's a time and place for this to be used. We know that. Unannounced gives you lots of, you know, a good amount of repetition, lots of decision making, and, and definitely more, rap, more match realistic. And then the last slide, you get, sorry, the last slide, the last section, the live area, it gives you less repetition, this area. So you get less goes at catching it, at saving it, at kicking it, whatever it may be. But you get loads of decision-making moments. And that, that's the closest part of the game. So how do you balance off this high level of relevance here? So there's your relevance. Your relevance is great up there. Maybe slightly less relevance when you do this. And then when do you do the stuff which is low relevance? Okay. So that relevance level at the bottom, that grade thing that I think it is, that one to 10, that's probably how much relevance you're, you're affording, offering up your uh, participants to have. Okay. Okay, video two, out of possession. Uh, again, another crossing one, because that's the, that's the topic of tonight. So we're, de we're defending the area and the goal from varied positions and situations. So the reason when you do crossing sessions or defending the area, I don't think it's ever just a crossing session because you have to have that option in there of if you're not coming for the cross, you're probably defending the goal then. So it's probably always, probably always two. Um, in here, we're getting positional choices linked to the ball, but now an opponent. Okay. And I'm definitely wanting more positive mentality in the actions. Otherwise you'll lose the practice. The triggers and cues, the crosser can move in the defined area. The crosser can combine to disrupt positioning and the two attackers provide interference. Uh, actions are interceptions, punches, catches, saves. There's, there's a lot going on in here. The rules are dead simple. You stay in goal, so you retain your place until the ball goes out the back of the six-yard box, the ball hits a mannequin or a goal is scored. So when you're in goal, if one of them things happened, you've lost, it's cost you a goal, you're out. But if you stay in goal, you get one point per repetition. So basically, you've got to be effective on every single action. Stretch and support would be adjusting mannequins, adding and removing players, expanding or reducing the service area will make things harder or easier. And I think this is a pretty live practice, maybe maybe a little bit lower than that circle is there. So maybe more around that like seven area, somewhere into unannounced. So there's your crosses. So there's two guys out wide. I've restricted them to that area. So they're stuck in that area. They can't do anything else but go in there. Two mannequins are black dots. The keeper's obviously green. And we've got two attackers. So that's how it looks. Really simple setup. But the rules, the constraints make this complex. Okay, and that's what should happen. You know, little crosses, little runs across the front, combination play, etc. Let's have a look. Okay, so you can see the setup. When I was watching, so he's out for that. Ball went out the back. He's out. Runs across the front. Disrupt. He's out. It cost him a goal, so he's out. On reflection, watching this session, I would have liked to have done it from a bit further out, maybe to have put the mannequins a bit deeper. That's a successful action, stopped it from hitting the mannequin. And you see the intensity he attacked that ball at because he wanted to stop it. I'm just going to rewind because I like that bit. He wanted to stop it from hitting the mannequin, okay, because he knows that costs him a goal. Don't let it hit the mannequin, stops it, gets to cross it. Different runs, disrupt, makes a block save. So this is a crossing session, but makes a block save, yeah? Different runners gone further out. That means the keeper's now more central. Ball leaves the back of the six. He's out. He's not out. My rules are slack. Now he's out. So straight away, we've had position. We've seen positions where the goalkeeper's been taking crop ball, starting from here, but then also a goalkeeper starting from here. So we're checking: are they in the correct positions? Run to disrupt. 
good touch. Good touch, but let's just go back and explore that a bit more. I've not, I've not drawn these ones up. Okay. So look at this. Look what happens here. So a little bit of combination play. Run across the keeper. Watch his movement now, guys. The goalkeeper gets pulled forward because of the run, but luckily is able to readjust and go and get a touch on it. But causing that disruption hopefully has made it more relevant. I just want to ask you to, to maybe riff off of this idea for a second, because this is something that I use sometimes with coaches of, of field players, which is I, I suggest that one thing that they should do, well, two things that they should do is one, when they make a stoppage, the first thing they should do is they should make sure that they recreate the conditions during the stoppage. In other words, if I stop players and say, pause, what do we do wrong there? Or what should we do here? Players have to be looking at the visual cues that tell them and if I so if I stop it afterwards and say pause when Phil had the ball um what were you looking at or what did you see or why did you do that if we're not actually looking at the situation I'm very unlikely to transfer what you're telling me to a game situation in other words I have to be looking at the problem to learn about problem solving because it all starts with perception so um but once I've done that, then a really good question, instead of what should you do is asking a player, what should, what do you see or what should you look at or what are you looking at? One of the most important things about this video is what's in his hand right now, right? He's got a clipboard in his hand, which uh, he's using. Well, I'll ask you, what's he using the clipboard for? Making notes on different ways the students are learning. Yeah, great. Thank you, Daniel. And that seems really trivial. You know, I would say not not one teacher in 10 walks around with a clipboard like this. But if you think about this from a working memory standpoint, if he thinks that he's gonna walk around and watch 30, play, 30, play, or 30 students do two math problems with four steps each for several minutes, and at the end of that time, he's gonna remember what is the most important, what were the mistakes that were made? What are the things that we did well? What's the most important thing to talk about? his working memory will quickly be overwhelmed by this because working memory is really, really small. He's gathering this whole data set because when he makes a stoppage, he wants to make sure that he's talking about the most important thing, right? That if, if it's one player, that it's like, there were five mistakes on this and one mistake on this. And so I want to focus on the thing that happened five times. And so he's kind of gathering data and stepping back a little bit. Or if this is a class, he wants to make sure he's going to talk about the things that's most relevant to the most number of students. But interestingly, he doesn't write down Daniela, remainder, he just checks on his clipboard two things to do to try and help yourself to be able to see more reliably the actual learning experience of your athletes while you're training them. I would say I would use this model, which is like a preparing to see model. First, I want to be really specific on what my goal is, what I want my athletes to work on. Then I would script out my exemplar. Here's what a world class goalie looks like doing X. The next thing I would write down would be like, here are two things that I think they're likely to struggle with. I'm more likely to see them if I've anticipated them. And um, to your point, Jason, about like not standing over their shoulder, not making them feel anxious. One of the things that I don't want to have happen is when a player makes a mistake, I say, we've been working on this all, if, if, we've been working on this all week, you got to get this, right? For the most part, I want them to expose their mistakes to me and be comfortable talking about the struggle of learning because I'd rather learn on Wednesday than on Saturday. And so if I've anticipated likely errors and I've thought about the exercise through an athlete's perspective, I am less upset at them. <laughs> I've thought about the, it normalizes the process of their getting things wrong and I'm less likely to get upset because I've thought through, oh, well, they'll probably struggle with this. What will they struggle with? And that makes me have less of an emotional reaction to it. 